little short today because we have another live stream coming up um, at uh, about an hour and 45 minutes from now um, that is celebrating the fact that it is, well, depending on how you compute it, a third of a century since Mathematica and Wolfram language were first released June 23rd, 1988. Actually, that makes me think I should explain this whole question about why is there uncertainty about what a third of a century actually is? Well, that's partly because there's uncertainty about uh, uh, what counts as uh, the, whether, whether it's a question of the Earth going around the sun, whether it's a question of the number of times the Earth has turned on its axis. It's a little bit complicated to compute the number of, uh, uh, the number of days how do you compute what corresponds to a century, what corresponds to uh, that uh, appropriate, if you slice up the number of days or you slice up the number of revolutions around the sun, whatever else. I think it all starts with the fact that, you know, how many days are there in a year? Well, it's uh, uh, for the earth to come back to the same place that it was at before relative to the fixed stars. I think it's usually the first point of Aries, the constellation of Aries, which is usually viewed as being the way that you sort of decide where the Earth has got to around its orbit. Because, um, and of course, they're not really fixed stars because all the stars are moving. They have proper motions, as they're called. Uh, stars are moving relative to each other at certain speeds. And uh, over the course of, for example, historical time, the star charts that were made in antiquity are no longer quite accurate today for several reasons. I mean, one, because of the stars moving around relative to each other, another because of the precession of the equinoxes, the fact that the Earth is, is the axis on which the Earth is rotating hasn't remained quite the same. But I think the, um, the question of how many days are there in a year, well, you say 365, but there aren't really. There's 365 point, I don't know what it is, 2481 or something. And uh, therein begins all the difficulty of what, uh, what exact, um, uh, the, uh, and, and people have, have come up with all these different calendar systems. You know, we have leap years to deal with. If, if we would have a precisely leap year rule, which says you add a February 29th every four years, if the length of the year was exactly 365, an integer, a whole number, plus one quarter, then it will be enough to just add one extra day every four years, but it isn't quite that. And instead it's a little less than a quarter. So that means that there's the exception of what is it? You don't add it every hundred years, but you do add it every 400 years. And it's been rather an elaborate scheme. And, and that's the, that those are the different uh, systems of the calendar that have been invented over the course of time. Um, the, uh, the, the one that we use is the so-called Gregorian chat calendar which was invented in the 1500s by Pope Gregory, because the earlier calendar, the Julian calendar, kind of put in place by Julius Caesar, had kind of, uh, had, had the, what, why is it a bad thing if you have the wrong number of days in your year? Well, the thing that tends to happen is that then you'll end up with, you know, Christmas time, for example, ends up being the middle of the, in the middle of the summer in the Northern Hemisphere, for example, because the date you call December 25th has moved in terms of where that means the Earth is in its orbit, and uh, so and, and what season it's in. That moves over the course of hundreds of years, and that had happened between the time of Julius Caesar and the 1500s. And so it was uh, the a, a different scheme was was invented at that time, which is the one we use today. Um, there are of course many other subtleties in computing what time it is where. Um, the one that I'll just mention is, um, I have just learned about this one recently. Um, time runs effectively more quickly if you're in a high gravitational field than if you're not. And so in particular, um, the, uh, that means that, and, and so in our models of physics, you can actually kind of understand why that's the case. It's in a sense, a high gravitational field is associated with the presence of more mass and more energy, and mass and energy are associated with more activity in this network that represents the small scale structure of space. 
And so in a sense, more higher, higher gravity, higher energy density, higher amount of activity in the fundamental structure of space. And so in a sense, time passes faster. And so that means that in places where there is in a sense, more gravity, time will pass faster. And that means that, for example, the surface of the earth, where we have the gravity that we are used to, the one G of gravitational attraction of us that holds us down to the ground, so to speak, and makes things drop to the ground and so on, the, uh, that's gravity, which causes acceleration at the rate of 9.81 roughly meters per second per second. Acceleration means that's the, uh, the, you measure speed in like meters per second or miles per hour or whatever else, and this is the acceleration is the rate at which that speed gets faster. So it's measured in meters per second per second. And so that 9.81 roughly meters per second per second is roughly the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the earth. It varies a bit over the, over the uh, different parts of the earth. And you know, if you're on a, near a mountain, if you have, if the crust of the earth is thicker in one place than another, it'll, it'll be somewhat variable. But if you compare that with the center of the Earth, well, there isn't any gravity going in any particular direction at the center of the Earth, at least associated with the Earth, because the, the force of gravity that's produced by the mass of pieces of the Earth is pulling in all different directions at the center of the Earth, because there's pieces of Earth in all those different directions. And so there's effectively no gravity there. So, so that means that, for example, if you drilled a hole through the Earth, then you would, uh, get to this point uh, and, and you sort of were to drop through that hole in the center of the earth, uh, through the center of the earth, then at the place where you're at the actual center of the earth, gravity will be as much pulling you back the way you came as pulling you forward the way you're going. And so if you were dropping through that, through that hole, you would just be sort of coasting on the velocity that you already got by the time you got to the center of the earth. And then by the time you get to the other side of the earth, you're, you've got uh, the sort of the, the, the earth above you is pulling you up and then you go back and you can kind of oscillate back and forth in this, in this tube and the, the, uh, going through the center of the earth, always having your maximum acceleration, maximum change of velocity at the two ends and no change of velocity, no acceleration in the center. And so that means there's less gravity in the center of the earth than there is at the surface of the earth. And you can ask, what does that mean for the passage of time? And the answer is in the history of the earth, the effective passage of time is a few days less time has passed at the center of the earth than at the outside, of the, than on the, on, the, on the exterior of the earth. So it's a, that's kind of another weird effect, small, very small on the scale of working out, you know, our one third of a century anniversary, but nevertheless kind of an interesting effect. All right, let's see. Um, Let's take some questions here that people had. Um, all right, saved up from last time. And again, I'm, I'm happy to try and address any questions about science, math, technology, whatever. There's one here from Yumi. Uh, why do mathematical folk create models if machine learning can create more complex and better models? Okay, that's an interesting question. All right. so. What is a model of a thing? What does it mean to have a model of something? It means you've somehow got some way to work out what will happen or understand the thing more simply than just by watching the thing do what it's doing. So for example, it would be if we say we have, I don't know, a model for, What's a good example? How a person moves through a crowd or how a, a traffic jam happens or how, a, or how heat uh, moves through a, a, a bar of metal or something. All of these things, you could just trace what happens to each person, what happens to each atom. You could just trace every detail of what's going on, but sort of the point, well, the, the, the first thing to say is, is um, uh, a model is, is kind of trying to give you a way to explain or predict what's going to happen. And some models are more useful on the explaining side than others. So for example, a model that just says to find out what will happen in 
the transmission of heat in a bar of metal just follow every atom, that might work, but its ability to explain at a human level what's going on is very low. Because you'd be saying, follow trillions of atoms and work out what happens with them. And then the aggregate is going to be this thing that we call the transmission of heat or whatever, a diffusion of heat. Um, so that that is low in terms of its ability to kind of um, uh, have a big picture explanation of what's going on. Now, of course, the first question is what what do you know the underlying mechanism by which heat is transmitted in this bar of metal? And for that, just knowing whether these atoms bouncing around and they do this and that, that's a good underlying explanation, but it isn't an explanation that is a, a sort of top level human understandable, so this is how you can reason about what's going on kind of explanation. Well, let's see, let, let's, let's zoom out for a little bit um, at, uh, um, talking about uh, the relationship between essentially mathematical models, machine learning models, and I'm gonna add one more, which is kind of computational models. So some models say, I can understand the mechanism by which this thing happens, and therefore I can compute what will go on. I can either do that by getting some mathematical formula, solving some mathematical equation, or I can do that by having some program that I run that reproduces how the system behaves. So that will be one kind of way to say what will happen in a system. The other way you could say what will happen in the system is by just looking at examples of what has happened in the system and trying to just learn by example and just have something where you've got a big inventory, a possible example, you say, well, if it looks like that, it's going to do this next. So let me give you the example of weather forecasting. So back in the day, um, when I was a kid, for example, most weather forecasting was done by looking at the pattern of winds and pressure, high pressures areas and so on, and just saying, meteorologists would just say, hey, I've seen something a bit like that before. You know, generally what happens is the cold front moves this way and that moves that way and so on. It's something where it's just you've got this big inventory of I've seen something like this before, so I think I know what's going to happen. What happened more recently was people started having sort of first principles computational models where it said, we've got this representation of the Earth's atmosphere in terms of uh, packets of air that are hot and cold, and we've got clouds they are difficult to model, but so be it. We've got you know, rain, we've got topography, we've got winds, all this kind of thing. And then we can just mechanistically compute what's going to happen. So it's kind of the trade-off between just match what happened before without knowing how it works at all and understand the mechanism and try and explain what's going to happen based on that mechanism. Now, just knowing the mechanism doesn't necessarily give you a, an explanatory story because, you know, take the weather forecasting example, you might be running some big complicated supercomputer computation and then it says it's going to rain tomorrow, but that doesn't really give you a, a sort of an understanding, an explanation of why it's going to rain tomorrow. It just says you run the computer calculation and it says it's going to rain, you know, so be it. Um, it you know, so that doesn't, it's not really a, a human level explanation. In fact, the other kind of explanation that says when there's a pattern that looks like this, it tends to do this, might be a better human level explanation. But anyway, in modern times, we have sort of a way to automate that process of just saying, look at a bunch of examples and say, is it gonna come out according to the way these examples say it's gonna come out? And that way of doing things is machine learning. And the idea there is you're just giving, you're giving all these examples and you're saying, okay, when there's a new example that comes in, how would that uh, sort of, how would that relate to the examples you've already seen? So for example, if you see an example that is in this form and that form, and the one you see is sort of in some sense halfway in between, you say, well, the outcome is probably going to be kind of halfway in between the outcomes of these, of these examples that we previously saw. Now, the question of whether this is going to work, so, so the, the, the kind of the thing that's happened over the last uh, little bit less than a decade is dramatic improvement in the ability to go from examples and be able to say what's gonna happen in a new example. A version of that, there are really two very basic kinds of 
of ways that set up classification and prediction. So in classification, the basic idea is you're showing lots of different pictures of cats, lots of different pictures of dogs. You're showing a new picture and you're asked to classify, is this a picture of a cat or a dog? And so that's one type of task. Another type of task is prediction. That's more what we're talking about here in these science things perhaps, which is to say, um, if we see, oh, I don't know, um, uh, in the cats and dogs example, if we see a picture of a cat and it looks like this, the weight of the cat will be X, just based on the picture of the cat, let's say, or the weight of the dog will be this. That will be an example of a prediction problem. And if we see kind of two different, we, what we want is if we have the, the, the St. Bernard that's really big and the, and the, and the uh, poodle that's really small, and then we see some kind of dog that's a mixture in between those, and all we've got is a picture, we, our goal is to try and deduce, try and predict what will be the weight of that intermediate dog. Okay, so how does that whole setup work? Well, it, it works by essentially having, well, it works by using a, a, a way of assuming that things are set up that is very similar to the way of assuming that things are set up that our brains use. So let me see if I can explain roughly how that works. Um, so the idea is, first of all, every image, every piece of input that you give is ground up until it's just a bunch of numbers. So in an image, you might take every pixel in the image and you might say there's a red, green, blue value there on in, uh, um, <clears throat> In sound, you know, you grind it up into sound intensity as a function of time and so on. You basically are grinding everything up until it's a bunch of numbers. And that gives you sort of the beginning of how you're starting to interpolate between these numbers. So what is interpolation? Let's say that you have uh, your, you have data, let's say as a function of time. So you're saying, you know, it's, you know, the values are one, one, seven, nine, 14, two, six, whatever. So we can, those are all a bunch of points at different, let's say at equally spaced times. And now we say, okay, I want to know what happened in between times two and three at, at time 2.5, for example, what happened? Well, the most obvious thing you can do is just take all those points that you might've plotted on a graph and just draw a line that goes linearly between each point. So you've got this piecewise linear approximation. You just have a, a, you know, you just put a line from one point to the next and so on. And then to work out what will be the value between those two points, you're just looking at where did the line reach at that particular X coordinate between those points. That's the most obvious uh, kind of way of interpolating between points, but you can be a little bit fancier than that. You can say, I don't want those jagged edges where the point comes up to the, where the line comes up to this point and then immediately comes down again. Let me smooth it out a bit. Let me make a nice smooth curve. And, and you say, well, well, that's nice. Um, you know, I, I can, but, but, uh, you know, that, then you have to ask the question, how, how elaborate should that curve be? If you've got all these data points and they're, they're in all these different places, maybe you want to just assume, oh, there's a single smooth curve, a single, let's say, a, even, a, a, even just a straight line that goes through all the points. But of course, it's probably not going to go through precisely all the points because some of the points will be a little bit above, a little bit below. Maybe that happens because those points were derived from some experimental data and there were some errors in the experimental data. And so the points were a little bit off where they should have been. And the real true model is just that straight line, single straight line, or the true model is that single, you know, uh, curve that just uh, has a sort of uh, a simple, uh, you know, dome type shape or something. Okay, so, so the idea of interpolation is to fit some kind of curve to your data and to try and make it so that it, well, usually in interpolation, you try and go through every point, but to fit some model where it's just you're fitting a curve and you say, this curve is the, a representation of this data. And if you want to predict where other data will be, just follow, just see where that curve would be at that point. Okay, so all kinds of terrible things can happen. For example, you can, you can overfit 
you can say, I'm really insisting that the, that the curve correctly rep reproduce every little detail of these points that we laid down, even though some of those points might be uh, the result of experimental errors and so on. And you know, even though it might be that everything should be just this nice straight line, but there's this one point that's out of, uh, out of where it should be. And, oh, we need to really account for that one point. So let's make this, this line really jig off to, the, to, to go through that point. And maybe that will be the right thing to do because that point is very important, or maybe that will be the wrong thing to do because that point was just a mistake. Okay, so in machine learning, what one is doing is essentially making those kinds of, um, uh, that, that kind of sort of interpolation through data. At least that's what one's doing. One is doing prediction in machine learning. When, and that's, and so what one can do in, in when one's thinking about sort of use machine learning from, for science, it's like, can one make that kind of, just given the examples, you make that kind of thing where you say, anything that I'm shown, I'm going to get the answer based on what I know happened in, the, in these examples. Well, needless to say, you don't get something for nothing. In the end, there has to be a model for making the model, so to speak. So it isn't the case that you can't decide just purely in the abstract, just from the data, oh, this is the best model, this is the best curve that fits the data or something. You have to have some overarching model for models, so to speak, that says this kind of curve is more likely to be right than that kind of curve. What's implicitly happened in machine learning is that the particular type of models that are being used are ones that follow somewhat the way that our brains work, the way that the sort of mathematical functions, the equivalent of mathematical functions that you get from neurons connecting to other neurons and causing other neurons to fire and all this kind of thing. And so in a sense, what is being done in machine learning is that we're following things that we humans say, oh, that's reasonable because that's kind of how our brains would do it. So uh, the, you know, the thing that one can then do is to say, okay, let's just by example, figure out what's gonna happen in this system, in this uh, system in nature or this, this thing we're trying to compute scientifically. That's thing number one. Or thing number two is, let's try and understand the mechanism by which the thing works and then try and compute from the mechanism what it's going to do. Okay, so there are, there are definitely trade-offs between these different approaches. There are plenty of things where we don't know anything about the mechanism really. So the only thing we can reasonably do is to use machine learning. Let me give an example. Let's say you're trying to predict how humans are going to click on different things on, you know, different, how they're going to respond to different kinds of uh, news articles that you put on some news feed. Well, we don't really have a theory of that. We don't have a good understanding, mechanistic understanding of how humans work at that level. So what we can best do is just say, let's look at a bunch of examples and then let's use machine learning to basically build that sort of model of, of humans based on just looking at examples. And again, it's not a modelless model. There is, in the end, machine learning is picking, there are an infinite number of possible models you could pick. Machine learning is picking one of those models. Just as on the mechanism side, when you try and figure out models in science, there's a certain tendency to pick the simplest model consistent with the data. That's usually called Occam's principle or Occam's razor after a chap who lived in the uh, 1200s, maybe, uh, William of Ockham, if I'm remembering correctly, who, um, who basically made this point, you know, if you're going to make a theory for what's going on, don't introduce all sorts of uh, unnecessary uh, sort of ornateness to the theory. Try and the, the most likely to be right theory is the theory that's simplest. So that's, that's sort of the mechanism side. But if you ask what are the trade-offs between a machine learning approach and a um, mechanism-based approach, the machine learning approach can work within a certain domain, but if something sort of goes wrong, if there's something where, oh, well, in that case, it would be going at a supersonic speed and then something completely different will happen, the machine learning method will not tell you that. The machine learning method will just say, hey, I've seen stuff more or less like this before. And, um, uh, you know, so this is what is going to happen. But if something unexpected happens, it's not going to know that because all it knows is what it's kind of seen before. Whereas a mechanism-based approach does have the chance if 
that that mechanism might lead to something quite unexpected happening. And indeed, that's what you see in a lot of cases when you take simple programs and you say, what does this program, what kind of behavior does this program lead to? Often the behavior you get is something very complicated and very unexpected based on the program itself. That's, that's kind of not, that unexpected thing is not what you would find from sort of the machine learning side of things. Now, you know, in a sense, there's a question, where has machine learning been successful? Where has it not? There's a certain argument that it's been successful in places where humans can also be successful. Finding, you know, that's a cat, that's a dog, things like that. There are other cases, there are a few other cases in science, uh, notably recently protein folding, where machine learning seems to be successful. Um, I kind of suspect that most of these successes, when you pull them back enough, are successes that are related to the human way of processing our image of the world, so to speak, our view of the world. And for example, I suspect, well, I haven't thought about this properly, but it, it could very well be when we say, uh, oh, it's so successful at doing protein folding, uh, you know, taking, figuring out these long molecules that are the proteins that make biological organisms like us up um, and figuring out how does that long molecule, some long molecules are very, very long and stringy, some are very globular, they, they kind of fold themselves up into a glob um, and uh, figuring out what shapes you get based on what the sequence of units are in, in the molecule um, has been a hard problem. But it could be that in the end, when you say we've succeeded in doing this folding problem, what you're saying is with respect to our description of uh, the description we care about, which is what molecule is near what molecule, that's a case in which we can successfully use machine learning. If we were interested in other features of the configuration that, that exists or something like that, we might not be able to use it. For example, if we were interested in something like the, um, the complete evolution path and whether the whether the molecule ever goes through some particular configuration and getting to that globular structure, it might be less useful. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, a little bit of a summary of um, uh, these questions about the relationship between modeling by mechanism, modeling by machine learning. Uh, in both cases, there are significant issues of saying, why did it come out that way? And machine learning, it's like you open up the neural net and it's just got a bunch of these random comparisons it's making and random computations it's doing. It's very hard to tell what it's doing. Similarly, when you study things by mechanism, it's often, well, you just run the program, it does all these complicated things, and in the end, it, it comes out this way. And it's hard to have a, an explanatory story of what's going on, although, Arguably, it, it can the, the, in the mathematical approach, when, when you end up getting a mathematical formula kind of, uh, kind of solution, you can often do much better at sort of humanizing the description of the mechanism that's used there. Let's see. Um, Uh, there's a question here which is comparatively simple. Um, he says, famous last words. That's always those are always the ones that um, uh, that I have the most trouble with. Those are the questions that seem simple. From gist here, can you create gold from lead by having some lead next to a big pile of plutonium? Uh, I think we've, we've talked a bunch about nuclear physics here, but let me, um, uh, let me talk about this a little bit. Back in the 1400s, 1500s, things like that, uh, people were obsessed with this idea of doing alchemy. Um, alchemy, you know, alchemy wound up later being things like chemistry, but alchemy, the, the sort of the, the big kind of uh, the, the holy grail of alchemy was turned lead, to turn lead into gold. People knew that you could do chemical reactions that would turn 
you know, this substance, which is a white powder, plus this substance with the white powder would turn it into a green frothy liquid or something. And it seemed like you were transforming matter from one, one kind of matter into another kind of matter. So the obvious question, could you take a base metal like lead that was really easy to get and turn it into a, a precious thing like gold? And that would be like you could, you could uh, make your own money, so to speak. Uh, you know, when there was when gold was sort of the basis as it was in those times for for monetary value, you could just take your pile of lead, it's worth nothing, you put it in your machine, and out comes a string of beautiful gold coins, and then you're, you're rich and famous, so to speak. So this was the goal of the alchemists for hundreds of years, was to find some way to, you know, reduce it with, you know, potassium permanganate and add heat it to this in this way. And and put some, uh, you know, uh, uh, put some silver around this, and then um, have that be happening at the time of the full moon, and so on. Nobody knew what would be important in determining what came out. You know, maybe it mattered that you were grinding it in certain ways. Maybe it mattered that you had uh, uh, some some strange thing that was the kind of the um, uh, uh, some strange plant that you would that had some that grew in some odd place, or you know, maybe it mattered that you had you know the horn of a unicorn. I think those were actually narwhals or something that were thought to be unicorn horns. But in any case, maybe it, it mattered that you had some some piece. People didn't know what mattered, but nobody managed to turn lead into gold. So the question is why not? And the answer is because chemical reactions. What in, in a when we have an atom, it has a nucleus made of protons and neutrons. It has electrons that are, are sort of far away from the nucleus, but still in that tiny little atom. When you do chemical reactions, what's happening is you're rearranging the electrons. You're rearranging the way that, for example, if you have two atomic nuclei, there can be electrons sort of floating around between the nuclei that bond those nuclei together. They make a covalent bond between those nuclei, things like that you can essentially rearrange, you know, chemicals, chemical compounds have a bunch of atomic nuclei, and then they have electrons in some complicated configuration, which sort of holds together the chemical compound. So when you have chemical reactions, what's always happening is the nuclei are going to where they, they, they're always kept unchanged, but instead the configuration of the electrons is changed and that means that positions of the nuclei can change, they can move around, One, some can get bound to other ones for now and then unbound and so on. But the nuclei stay the same. And what was realized by the mid 1800s, I guess, is that, uh, although not in detail because people didn't understand the structure of the nucleus until the early 1900s, um, the, the idea that, that, well, you can change the electron structure, but you can't change the nucleus structure. And lead, the difference between lead and gold is a different nucleus. In particular, the different chemical elements are characterized by the fact that they have different number of protons in the nucleus of their atoms. So hydrogen one, helium two, uh, hydrogen, helium, lithium three, beryllium four, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, down to lead, which is, what is lead? Um, ah. Gold, I think, is 79 protons, and lead is like 89, 90 protons, something like that. So basically, you have two different kinds of nuclei for lead and gold. Okay, how can you change one nucleus into the other? Well, the answer is you have to kick it really hard, and then you can eject some protons from the lead nucleus. And eventually, if you eject just the right number of protons, you'll wind up with a gold nucleus. It's pretty hard to achieve that because most of the time, if you kick the nucleus hard enough by having some high energy particle, like maybe a neutron that was uh, came out of a nuclear reactor that's just tooling along and it bashes into the nucleus and kapow, the nucleus falls apart, the, um, it's, uh, that doesn't typically end you up with, oh, and I got exactly the right number of protons to wind up with gold. But by, by sort of careful arrangement, you could perhaps, I don't know how easy it is to do this, you could perhaps, I mean, nuclei tend to be bound tightly together by nuclear forces. And if you like kick them hard enough that pieces fall off, 
uh, I think it tends to be the case that the nucleus will sort of uh, will typically shatter rather than the nucleus just having a little piece that falls off here. Um, so I think it's tough to do that. And uh, the, the question asked had to do with plutonium. Plutonium is an element which is naturally radioactive in the sense that uh, its, nuclei, uh, its nuclei pieces fall off the nucleus. And uh, I'm trying to remember what plutonium is it an alpha emitter, I'm not sure. Or maybe it has spontaneous fission, I'm not sure. Um, but the, there are different ways in which the nucleus, either bits can fall off the nucleus spontaneously, or the nucleus can just sort of fall apart spontaneously into, into let's say, two big pieces. And that's what's happening in plutonium. Uh, there, there you, there's no stable plutonium. The nucleus won't hang together for, for, uh, for, for an infinite time. And so pieces fall off. Those pieces can go hit other nuclei, like they could hit lead nuclei, and do something to those lead nuclei, I think it's tough to arrange it to wind up just turning into gold, as opposed to turning into gold together with mercury, together with this, together with that, all these different, um, all these different elements. Um, so in principle, but in practice, no. And you know, it's almost, I, I suspect if you do that with nuclear physics, it's almost kind of like panning for gold in the sense that you'll just get a whole bunch of different nuclei out. And you have to go separate the nuclei and say, hey, is one of those a gold nuclei? Nucleus, great. And in doing all of that stuff, you will spend a lot more than it costs to mine a, another ounce of gold out of the ground. Um, okay, there's a question here. Uh, from Gecko, Gecko, how proportional is public opinion of a person to the actual achievement of that person generally? Boy, well, we're not, we're a little bit uh, out of the science and technology zone here. It's interesting to look at that question historically. There are people who were very famous in their time and unknown sometime later. There were people who were almost unknown in their time and became very famous later. And I think there are different kinds of things that happen. So for example, at any given time, there are things where sort of everybody knows this is important. And well, it's important at the time, but then later on in history, it's like, who cares? Like for example, there was a time when it was really important to try and make better mechanical calculators. And people made, uh, I don't think anybody got terribly famous doing this, but people made you know, the better and better mechanical calculators through, up through the 1960s and so on. And then electronic calculators were invented and like nobody cared about those achievements. They're magnificent, but nobody cares. And so that was a thing where, where sort of the tide of history caused what might've been an important achievement in its time to look unimportant later because the context of what people were thinking about had changed. So there are cases where, uh, I mean, there, there, there are different things that determine sort of the visibility of people at a given time. I mean, another thing is in, in science, for example, there's sort of a, a certain, there's people who will go off and figure out a bunch of great science. There are people who will do that and not be able to explain it to anybody. And sometimes you can see from the effects, from the results, oh, this person computed this number and somebody did an experiment and they measured that number and it came out right. There must be something wonderful there, even though the person is not very good at explaining what they did and nobody can really understand what, what was going on inside. Um, and so that's a case where sort of there's, there's but, but somebody had to care about that number. It's the same in mathematics. If somebody, there are these famous problems, Fermat's last theorem, the Riemann hypothesis, uh, things like this, Goldbach's conjecture. These are, in a sense, somewhat random problems out of the set of all possible problems in mathematics. But if somebody solves the Goldbach conjecture, for example, that will be a person very famous in mathematics, um, uh, probably, because that's something which, because of sort of the history of people talking about it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it seemed like an important thing. Now it might turn out that the, uh, well, the four color conjecture, the four color theorem, whether you can take a map of the world, for example, 
and use only four colors to color the countries with the constraint that no countries that are adjacent will ever be the same color. That was kind of a, a big deal. You know, is somebody going to prove it? Is it not going to be proved? In the end, it was proved by a rather, uh, as many mathematicians thought, a rather brute force, mundane, computer-based, sort of uninteresting proof. And so you don't hear so much about that anymore because it was kind of like, well, yeah, it kind of got worked out, but it got worked out in, in, a, in a not so mathematically interesting way. So anyway, there's this, there's this sort of question, is the thing that's being done famous in its time? Does it become famous a lot later? Does it, is it, does it become the case? I mean, for example, uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity, very famous today. When it was first invented, it was famous, but it wasn't nearly as famous as it is today. Actually, better example, uh, the Turing machine. Alan Turing's uh, invention of sort of a, a mechanical concept for how computers might work. Uh, really not that famous at the time, 1936. Became much more famous later when people really started understanding the context of computing and the fact that what Turing had discovered was more universal than people had thought and so on. And so that sort of the fame of that uh, gradually increased. I mean, I think there, is, there are these different dimensions. Is the thing something where people know to care at that moment in history? That's one parameter. Another parameter is, is the thing being explained in a way that people can understand? There can be some brilliant theory, but it's explained so in such uh, difficult to understand terms that you even sometimes wonder, did the person who invented it really understand it? Or did they just sort of throw things together and it sort of happened to work? And the next person down the line might have thrown things together and it might have sounded the same, but it didn't happen to work. So that's, a, that's another piece. Um, another thing that can happen is in cases where things are not very clear, it can be the case that somebody has sort of put pieces together. And at the time, it's like nobody's people say, oh, well, I don't know what that means. Then later on, for other reasons, things become very clear. And then you go back and you say, by golly, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, that person, they really nailed it. They really got it. Now that we can see how it all works out, we can see that what that person was talking about at that time really had got the essential point. That's a tricky one. That's a tricky one to know what to really conclude from that. Whether in fact, what one is seeing is something where the person didn't really understand. I mean, what does it mean to understand it? If you went back and interviewed that person in modern terminology, the person would have no idea what you're talking about because those terms, that whole context hadn't been invented in that time. So if it was, do they understand in terms of your interview, what they were talking about, the answer would be no. And you might say, well, then the person didn't figure anything out, but that wouldn't be fair either. That wouldn't be right either. It would be because there might be something that was figured out. It might even be a thing which in the person's own mind was completely clear, just not communicated very well to anybody else. Okay, so the other side of the effect is there are people at any given time in history who are really good at describing science and um, the uh, uh, and at explaining things, but that is an independent skill. Well, maybe not such an independent skill. It is not a, a skill that is entirely correlated with the ability to develop new science. There are people who are very good at explaining science and who have never particularly done research and discovered new science. Maybe they've done some research, but they aren't sort of major producers in terms of new science, but they're quite good at explaining what already exists. And there are people who are good at doing new science who are terrible at explaining what exists or even explaining what they themselves have done. I tend to favor the idea, I have to say, because I've known a lot of people who've discovered a lot of, lot of interesting things in science and so on. I would say that the vast majority of people, and maybe it's somewhat selected by people that I choose to interact with, the vast majority of people who've done important things in science are actually not bad at explaining what's going on. They may have, uh, they may have good, better or worse you know, English writing skills. They may have the ability only to write a very technical paper that can be understood only by a narrow set of people. But in the end, if you talk to them, their understanding of what's going on is usually quite clear. Um, it's not, uh, you know, there, there are cases where there are people where 
Uh, I can think of some mathematicians, for example, where uh, I think one has to know a lot to be able to sort of untangle what is this person really talking about. Um, but I think the um, so so you know what can happen is that you can have a situation where people say, you know, uh, oh, um, it's uh, only the messenger is important, so to speak. It's kind of like people who say, uh, you know, I I found this thing in a through a, in a search engine, you know, as if the search engine is the thing responsible for the content. It's not. It's responsible for helping you find the content, but the content is coming from somewhere else. It's some random website that got put up by by somebody. Um, so it would be similarly in kind of uh, understanding science. There's the well. I learned about that from messenger X, so to speak, from this person who explained it, that's an important skill in its own right, but that isn't necessarily the originating, um, uh, you know, that, that typically won't be. It's a, it's a somewhat rarer case where the explanation goes hand in hand with the actual uh, doing of the frontline science. I mean, I, I myself put a lot of effort into explaining things as, you know, doing sort of frontline science and explaining that frontline science, I have to say, in my own experience, that is a slightly self-defeating activity. And the reason is that in sort of the professional doing of science, people are used to the idea that it isn't the same people that explain stuff well and do the frontline stuff. And so if the frontline stuff is explained really well, people are like, can this really be the frontline stuff? Because usually it's only explained after the fact. Actually, they're wrong in that belief. If you go back and look at the original papers of many different things, it is, it is common, not always the case, maybe a third of the time, the original paper is beautifully clear and the things that came later were much less clear. Sometimes the original paper is not so clear and the typical reasons for that are either the, the kind of the notation that the person is using is, is very funky or the original motivation that caused the paper to be written is one that is hard for us to understand now, or, or something about kind of the notation that's used. I mean, you know, if you take Alan Turing's paper on the on the Turing machine, you know, um, the the um, uh, the title of the paper is on computable numbers and something like a solution to the Entscheidens problem. Okay, now is that really the paper that you expect introduces the idea? Well, one of the one of the versions of of um, uh, of this is how computers are going to work. No, it's a it's a it's a paper much more obscurely titled. Now, it's actually a paper where the introduction and the basic structure of the paper is very nice and clear. The notation that's used is is quite impenetrable. It's it's full of these bizarre Gothic letters, and it's just it's complicated. It was the first computer program in some sense. And one didn't know how to write nice, clean, structured programs in those days. And it wasn't a nice, clean, structured program. Actually, it was also full of bugs. But, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a, um, uh, and by the way, Alan Turing is a good example of somebody who, yeah, that's an interesting story as well. The question is, what is the relationship between the personal story of a scientist, let's say, and their degree of, of how seriously one takes them or how seriously people take them. And that, that's a very messy story. It's a very messy story because there are scientists where looking back in history, perhaps even at the time, you say, oh, that person was a terrible schmuck for this or that reason. And, you know, good science gets done by schmucky people. Good science gets done by very unschmucky people. You know, bad science gets done by very unschmucky people. It's a, it's a whole mixture. And so, again, that's not a, um, and sometimes there are people who were famous in their time because, oh, that person, uh, looking back in earlier times in history, you know, that person was a famous diplomat. Oh, they were also a mathematician on the side. And, you know, probably in their time, they were mostly known as a diplomat. And it's only after the fact that they get known as a mathematician. So I think in um, uh, and in in uh, you know it is it's a funny thing because because uh, you know you also can ask the question 
uh, known to whom, so to speak. Um, the, uh, but you, I think the question was public opinion of a person. So that's a complicated story as well, because the public, in quotes, typically, perhaps unfortunately, doesn't really know that much about what's sort of happening at the front lines of science. I, in my own efforts, I've tried to expose what we're doing at the sort of front lines of science as publicly as possible, because I think it's kind of interesting and I think it's a worthwhile thing to do. Um, but uh, normally most frontline science gets done sort of behind closed lab doors or behind closed university doors or, or whatever. And it's not, it's not immediately visible. It only becomes visible to the public, uh, you know, after there's either, you know, the news report of the cool thing that got discovered or more likely the kind of the description of things that gets written by a quotes popularizer of science, typically not the same people, not always not the same, but typically not the same people as the people who made the frontline discovery. So um, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of complicated mixture of, um, of, of those things. Well, I think uh, we should, um, Go uh, do just one more one more question here, and then we should wrap up because um, uh, I want to get ready for our one third of a century Mathematica celebration. Okay, there's a question here from uh, RBS on how would one build a UFO? What technology would be needed? Mathematical achievements and so on. I'm going to argue that. That question is, is philosophically wrong. If we built it, it is not an unidentified flying object. Presumably, it is an identified flying object because we built it and we know what it is. By the way, I think um, the, the modern term for U UFOs, unidentified flying objects, um, seem to be, I think they peaked in interest around in the 1950s. Um, where people were reporting UFOs all the time of, you know, there's this strange thing. And, and probably there were some strange things because probably a bunch of, you know, Air Force tests of all kinds of strange vehicles. And maybe there were spy planes from other countries being flying over and all kinds of funky stuff going on, uh, you know, in the sky, so to speak. Um, the, uh, the sort of modern term, the modern, uh, I don't know, um, I wouldn't say scientifically correct, I wouldn't say politically correct either, but the modern, uh, more delicate term is UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. Actually, there's a project um, uh, being, which I suppose I'm somehow some kind of advisor to, um, that, um, because I like these kinds of things, that's trying to, uh, it's the Galileo project, um, just started up a few months ago, that's trying to, um, uh, uh, detect unidentified aerial phenomena. And um, the, uh, the basic idea is you just put cameras that are watching the sky everywhere and you see if they're funky things that show up there. And it turns out that if you are interested in things that are pretty high up, like 30,000 feet or something, you don't need that many cameras to cover, let's say, the US. You need maybe, I don't know, 20, 25 or something things. You put them somewhere and they're looking up at this kind of cone of sky. And uh, just like from a plane at 35,000 feet, you can see 240 miles, assuming that there isn't, that, that, that it's a, a clear day. That's the distance it is to the horizon based on the, the height you are above the, above the curved earth, so to speak. And so similarly, uh, if you have this camera that's looking up at a cone of sky, it can see a long way ar around it, so long as you're asking how to see only things that are quite high up. And so you don't need that many of those uh, sort of cameras. You put them on trucks or something and move them to different places around, around, let's say, around the US. And then you can kind of pretty much map out, is there anything funky going on in the, in the sky, so to speak? And I have to say, I'm... I'm uh, I mean, I assume one will detect, obviously one see all the planes go by, but one presumably knows where all the planes are. And, um, the, um, and occasionally one will see a meteorite or something like this. And maybe we'll see some strange phenomenon. My, my, uh, my guess is 
that it'll be meteorological phenomena that one sees that are unexpected, more so than uh, you know the strange interstellar spacecraft type thing. Now, if the question is how would you make an interstellar spacecraft, that's a that's an entirely different question, and that's a question we really don't know the answer to yet. I mean, there are efforts to make really tiny interstellar spacecraft. I think I even have a little little sample of one of those things, tiny little tiny little sort of single chip thing where you imagine you have a giant kind of uh, solar sail type thing where you have something pushed by light pressure that um, you can kind of have a laser that shines on the thing and sort of keeps pushing it and pushing it away um, until it goes sort of off to the, the, the a different um, star system. It takes a really long time. Even you know going at a decent speed, it takes, uh, by decent speed, I mean a significant fraction of the speed of light, it takes a while to get four light years to the nearest uh, other star. And I think the um, people don't know by the time you're going at, you know, 99% of the speed of light or something like this, uh, you know, if you run into anything at that speed, it's bad news and it's complicated dynamics of, and, you know, in interstellar space, there is roughly only one hydrogen atom per cubic meter, but uh, I don't really know the extent to which Kind of, you know, it's it's like um, uh, if you're going fast enough, you're still going to see those impacts. And I don't really know what what effect that has and how difficult that is to deal with. When it comes to, you know, taking uh, us humans off to um, other, uh, you know, other solar systems and so on, that's a pretty tall order. And um, I, you know, I kind of wonder, you know, there've been a bunch of science fiction movies. Um, was one quite recently about that. Oh, I can't know what it was about, but um, well, I, I can't remember what it was called. But but um, about uh, you know the the perils of sort of multiple generations existing on some spacecraft. Uh, you know, this is our world type thing for the next however many generations until we can reach a nearby star. Um, it'd be interesting to to speculate on um, uh, uh, you know on how that would work out. Um, I think. Uh, you know, it seems pretty challenging. It doesn't seem like the form factor of uh, human biological organisms is particularly well suited to interstellar travel. And I, I kind of think that it's, you know, it's, it's, more the, it's, it's more for our computers than for us, I would say. And at a time when, you know, we might have sort of a, a human-like consciousness that we can say it's uploaded into this computer, it's like those are the things to go off and... Uh, explore the rest of the galaxy. I think it all becomes very, very virtualized very quickly and very much related to questions about sort of what do we really mean by intelligence and so on. And we've got this, this lump of, of, of stuff that is running all these computations and, and it's off to the nearest star and it's concluding this and that. And it, it becomes a sort of very philosophically complicated issue. So I think the, your average, um, uh, the only thing to say about your average um, UFO of the past was people were like, well, I know what a plane is, I know what a kite is, maybe I know what a helicopter is, but something that's a flying saucer, which was a very common uh, sort of shape of these things, maybe the lenticular clouds or something, but, but um, very common shape from the 1950s, the flying saucer type thing. Um, it's like, what will let you have a saucer-like object that can just fly? And I have to say, as is so often the case, you know, a modern drone with, uh, you know, a multi-rotor drone could look an awful lot. I'm sure you could make and I, I bet somebody's done this, um, to make a flying saucer-like thing feels like a good Kickstarter kind of, kind of campaign to, you know, the flying saucer drone, that it looks like a classic 1950s flying saucer, but actually it's flying because it has 10 rotors embedded in it that are, uh, that are spinning around and, um, uh, in the past, there wouldn't have been possible to make the control system to have a sort of 10 rotor device fly stably, but, but now it is. All right, we should wrap up here. And um, uh, thanks for those interesting questions. And for those who are interested, we have another live stream coming up, uh, celebrating our one third of a century of Mathematica and Wolfram language coming up soon. So thanks and uh, 